very happy to, to introduce our, our first speaker, uh, Peter Hybers, a personal friend. Uh, he's coming to us from Harvard University, where he's the co-director of uh, the Harvard University Center for the Environment. Uh, he's a professor of Earth and Planetary Sciences and also of uh, Environmental Science and Engineering. Uh, he's an absolute hero in our field. Uh, he's uh, one of the very best people we have in this community. Uh, he's a MacArthur Fellow. He's a, a, a Awarding a number of other areas, but um, we're really honored to have him here with us. And he promised to show us some new, and as I promised, unpublished, but really exciting results. Peter. Okay, thank you, Peter. Uh, it, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I want to share some of the kind of technical results that we're coming up with. And what, what I'm so excited about is to share with a community who knows how to take action in a timely manner. Um, much of what we need to do around issues of climate is to understand how we can actually go from um, conceptualization in a rather abstract form to actions that have pertinence and meaning uh, and time scales that we're actually able to um, meet the challenge as it's evolving. So um, let's see, I have a presentation. Uh, let's see, it's going to work and I do this or not. Okay. Here I am. Here I am. Uh, like right again? Okay. And let me uh, let, let me ask you this question. So I'm going to take this down to almost an, an absurd level of abstraction and ask the question of if there was just two numbers that you could know about how the climate system is behaving, what would they be? Okay. And so, you know, if we're thinking about issues uh, that will arise from climate change, they're all going to play it out at the local level. They're going to play out with individuals, and we need to get down to that granular scale. But there are these evolving boundary conditions over which the climate system is going to change. And we need to have good information about them as well. So this, my talk is really going to be at this uh, thousand foot level. Uh, other people will be talking in more specificity after that. Um, <coughs> this is a decent place to start. Okay, so here, here's my answer to these questions. Right, one would be how much will climate warm in response to a doubling of atmospheric CO2 concentrations. This is the sensitivity of our climate system to greenhouse gases. Okay. This is also known as uh, equilibrium climate sensitivity. And I'll be using that term uh, in the next few minutes here. And then the second is how much will sea level rise by 2100. The date here is relevant because with sea level, it's not just what the sensitivity is, but how rapidly is this going to play out over time. Uh, and particularly how rapidly is sea level going to accelerate as we come forward. Now, there's actually a problem in the, in the scientific community that we have right now about understanding what this equilibrium climate sensitivity is going to be. How much is the Earth going to ultimately warm if we double atmospheric CO2 concentrations and hold them like that over time? And there's really two streams of evidence. Uh, one, which has come online fairly recently, uses historical instrumental records and <coughs> draw inferences by, uh, regarding how much the climate will ultimately warm and these lines of information, and, and they give you a range of about one to three degrees Celsius. Another stream of information comes from model simulations and from assessments of paleoclimate records, and those give you almost twice as much, two to five degrees Celsius. Now, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and its first four assessment reports were much more on this uh, upper range. Uh, in the most recent version, they're attempting to reconcile what are really uh, rather distinct central estimates, uh, and this made it into footnote 16 of their most recent uh, assessment report number five, released in 2015. And what they said is that um, no best estimate for equilibrium climate sensitivity can now be given because of a lack of agreement on values across assessed lines of evidence and studies. But that's somewhat problematic. Right? This in some ways is uh, you know, a frontline uncertainty. Probably shouldn't have been footnote 16. Um, <laughs> but, uh, we, we have some work that's going to come out uh, in Science Advances uh, in two weeks, which attempts to resolve this discrepancy in, in a way that I think is meaningful. And let me walk you through that, okay? So we're going to get into the technical weeds here a little bit, and maybe that'll be useful to you, I, I hope. Um, so here's Climate 101 uh, with regard to a framework for estimating equilibrium climate sensitivity. Okay, so if you double atmospheric CO2 concentrations, what happens is you have more radiation shining down on the surface. That's going to be the delta F here, the increase in radiative forcing of the surface. Okay, now there's two things that can happen with that radiation. It can be absorbed and it can heat the interior of the Earth. That's going to be the change in the heat content. That's mostly being absorbed by the oceans, about 90% of this heat over time. 
Now, the other thing that can happen is the surface can radiate energy back. Okay. And so we have a simple balance here. Increase forcing down. You either heat the interior or you radiate the energy back. And then we're going to make a very um, suspect but helpfully simplifying assumption. And that's going to be that the amount of radiation which is going back up can be written as a linear function of the change in temperature. So that's that lambda t term over there. Okay. Now, if you take historical estimates of how these properties have behaved since 1970, what you see is that the cumulative anomaly and radiative forcing of the surface, this is the gray line, has been coming up over time. And that, that is roughly equal to the sum of the total amount of additional heat that the Earth is storing now, as well as the additional heat which has been radiated back upward. Okay. These are units of zeta joules. It's 10 to the 21st joules, big numbers. Um, and uh, it, it gives a framework for thinking about what is the sensitivity of the climate system. Okay, it's really that lambda parameter that tells you that. Okay, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change the axes on you here, and then I'm going to stick with that set for a second. What I'm going to do is I'm going to plot change in heat content on the y-axis, I'm going to plot change in temperature on the x-axis. Okay? And if you look at a line then in that space, that's lambda. That's the slope of this relationship, and that's the critical term for figuring out what the equilibrium climate sensitivity would be. So let's, let's do this simple experiment. Let's say we double atmospheric CO2 instantaneously. And now we think about what does the system do at time t equals zero. Its immediate response is that it doesn't have any time to warm up, and so what it's going to have to do is start to heat up. Okay, so we'll see a change in heating. And that rate of additional heating, if you double atmospheric CO2, is about 4 watts per meter squared. It's a little bit uncertain, but it's a, it's a good estimate. Okay, now if we evolve this through time, so let's say we go a few decades forward, and now we come to another time point. Okay, what you'll see is that the surface will have heated up. The radiation that is being sent back upward is increasing. And so the amount of heat that is being absorbed is decreasing. And if you are brave, what you could do is say, well, this defines a linear function, which we can extrapolate to equilibrium. Okay? And that's what people pretty much have been doing when they're using the historical instrumental records. They say, well, we can define this with observations over a few decades. Let's, let's pretend that this is how the system is going to run all the way to equilibrium. And we'll have a change in temperature of about 2 degrees Celsius in that case. It's, it's, really, it's, it's really as simple as that uh, when you put it into this, into this space here. Okay. Um, so that's, that's kind of one way of thinking about the problem. I, and I, I like using data in a smart way. I like actually observed data from the climate system. And so there's a lot of reasons to think that this approach uh, has some validity and some meaning to it. Um, I'm usually suspect of climate models. These are simulations which are often somewhat unconstrained, but they can tell us a lot about the processes that are ongoing. And so let's look, if we look in this delta T, delta H space, how a general circulation climate model, millions of lines of code run on a supercomputer, uh, integrated over hundreds of model years, how does that behave? Okay, and so I'm, I'm just going to stick on this plot here for a second. A bit of information here. The brown dots are annual <coughs> average values. The ones at the far left are after the first, second, third year of the model integration, <coughs> and then we go forward in time. And what you can see is that these dots are not just falling along a single straight line. Okay, there's a curvature in this space. The decadal smoothed average is shown in black. And then what we've done is gone to 24 such models, and we've layered on top of them a, a hierarchical Bayesian statistical model, which uh, basically means that we are uh, as fully as possible accounting for all sorts of uncertainties and what we can actually extract from a model simulation like this. Okay. And that's what these pink lines are, and they define, uh, if you extrapolate out to zero temperature change, what the radiative forcing is associated with doubling atmospheric CO2. And if you extrapolate to the x-intercept there, you get an estimate of equilibrium climate sensitivity. And it's quite different. Right? Instead of 2 degrees Celsius, like you would have if you just extrapolated a linear fit to the first few years of what this model was doing, you end up with this curved space and it takes you out into the tail of equilibrium climate sensitivity estimates. Okay. Um, now, let me just briefly touch on physically what's happening here. We can take this uh, hierarchical model fit and we can look uh, at what it tells us about regional changes when we average across all 24 of these different general circulation models. Okay, and so, so here, here's what, what I'm showing you is 
if we took present day atmospheric conditions, so how much CO2 is in the atmosphere now, and we held that fixed and we let the climate evolve for a long time so it came into equilibrium, we'd have a certain amount of warming in each location. And then we could take the fraction of the amount of warming that we've realized to date relative to how much warming is going to happen eventually in this hypothetical where we keep a, a constant CO2. This is a, a sense of a committed warming. And what you see is over the United States, uh, about half of the committed warming is already realized. These are continental regions, they warm up fairly quickly. The places like the Eastern Equatorial Pacific, and even more so the Southern Ocean, where you have cold water that's coming up to the surface, take much longer to come into equilibrium. And so what it is, is that these really long, slowly adjusting uh, aspects of the climate system are um, also happen to be ones that have powerful positive feedbacks associated with them. We're not gonna realize them until later. Okay, so the type of warming we've had so far has been evident and clear and had all sorts of implications, but the warming <coughs> we're gonna get in the future is actually rather distinct. There's different modes that are gonna be evoked. Okay. And then you can put all this together and come up with two different distributions. On the right, what you see is our best estimate of equilibrium climate sensitivity. sensitivity. It's actually a little higher than what the IPCC has been reporting in previous reports. And on the left is the counterfactuals, as if we took the climate models and did the same thing that people are doing with the historical instrumental estimates to estimate what the equilibrium climate sensitivity is. And you can see that's distinctly lower. The whole distribution has shift, shifted to values about one to three, okay? And so this, uh, I, I think, is a complete and sufficient explanation for the discrepancy between these two different estimates of equilibrium and climate sensitivity. What people have been doing with instrumental records is interesting, but it doesn't actually correspond to the physics of the system. You're missing important slow modes that will come to the fore eventually. Okay, now, what that means is, yeah, they're both estimates, but they're just not the same thing, so you can't really compare them. Let me say briefly a couple things about global mean sea level. I'm going to kind of continue on this idea of curvature. Uh, this, this is prompted by something I read in the Wall Street Journal a couple weeks ago. And this is Stephen Koonin, who's over at NYU. And what he's arguing is that there's these big fundamental aspects of our understanding uh, that are uncertain. And I agree with him. There are big questions out there. But we need to focus on the right questions. And the one that he happened to focus on in his op-ed was uh, the apparent and unexpected slowing of global sea level rise over the past two decades, which sounds like a big deal. Um, so there's really not much substance there when you look at it. So I, I had a little bit of an exchange, uh, and he was relying on this paper by Facillo et al. in 2016. And in this <coughs> paper, uh, what they did is they measured sea level rates over two different intervals with linear trends. And you can kind of see they're missing the bigger story, right? So the, <laughs> the green line is about three millimeters per year, the red line is about two millimeters per year, and yeah, sure, two is less than three, but that doesn't describe what's going on. <coughs> it's crazy, you publish a paper in 2016 and you don't use the last four years of data from the satellites <laughs> that we have here. Okay, so maybe this would be a better thing to say, let's fit a linear trend to all the data that we have, and then let's fit a quadratic trend. Linear green, quadratic, and red, and you can see that there is this slight curvature that gets picked up. It's still a rather poor fit to the observations. Um, and really, this is just a really short interval by which to define what the climate system is doing. And so what you'd really want to do is go back further in time. I'm going to call on some results by Carling Hay, who's a, she was a graduate student uh, at Harvard. She just graduated, and this is a paper she wrote in 2015. And she used high gauge records to go back and estimate what sea level has done since about 1900. And there, you really see this curvature coming out much more clearly. The red line is clearly more curved. If you were to follow this linear line out to 2100, what you get is about 30 centimeters of sea level rise. If you take this accelerating trend out to 2100, you get uh, about 60 centimeters of sea level rise. I wouldn't rule out that it's a good deal higher than that. We actually have deep uncertainty about how rapidly ice will flow into the ocean. And that's a major kind of critical question for thinking about the 2100 sea level problem. Okay. So that's all I have time for. Let me just wrap up here and say that um, Estimates of equilibrium climate sensitivity based on historical instrumental records are consistent with those derived from paleoclimate records and simulations once they are properly compared. Okay. And then second, rates of sea level rise have accelerated over the last century, suggesting more rapid rise going forward. And then finally, let me make a little bit of a broader point, that the climate system is complex, but much of the confusion about its fundamental behavior can actually be resolved if you examine the data carefully. I'll leave it at that. Thanks.
Um, <clears throat> thank you, Peter. I think we're going to save uh, questions until uh, the last part. So with these lightning talks, we're pairing a, a, a science leader with a, a leader in business on this. And here we have uh, Christopher Mayer, who's at, at Columbia University as well. Uh, he's the Paul Milstein Professor of Real Estate at the Columbia Business School. He's a principal at Long Bridge Financial as well. Thanks. We will have a deck shortly. Um, so just as we uh, go ahead and click right. yeah. Ah, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Even better than I thought. Um, so I appreciate the uh, invitation to come here. I should concede straight off that um, while I've spent a lot of my uh, life studying housing and credit markets and real estate, um, and teaching, uh, teaching for a couple of uh, couple of decades. Um, areas of climate change and the environment are not areas I've spent uh, a lot of time in my career looking at. Uh, but I will say that having done a little bit of work in preparation for this talk, it's started to intrigue me um, a lot more. So what I what I you know it's hard to sort of not look at see what's going on when you look at the press. I decided. You know, for maybe obvious reasons, look at the Wall Street Journal and just sort of find some recent headlines uh, from the journal on this issue. And so, you know, there's the usual kind of studies, sea levels are rising um, that uh, Peter talked a little bit about. Um, and some of the things that people elsewhere in the world are doing uh, who are faced with imminent problems. As you can sort of debate, you know, numbers on a chart, but if you're actually living on an island where the water is rising and you're losing land, it's a little bit harder to sort of debate is this a fact or what the direction is. You're actually just literally slowly sinking um, into the water, and that is obviously a problem. And there are other places. There's been a lot written on what Singapore is doing as a place which is really threatened by. Um, um, even as it turned out, the, the first thing I kind of did in looking at this was bumping into an exhibit at MoMA back in 2010. Um, and Henry Kravis here is a big uh, supporter at, uh, at MoMA. And they did a thing on how to integrate design and sea level rises back in 2010, which incidentally was just prior to Hurricane Sandy. So this has been an issue which has caught at least some people in the world as kind of an important question in a variety of places. Um, and this is, by the way, their sort of view of what New York, you know, what you would do with New York Harbor to try and sort of preserve um, lower Manhattan in the, you know, in the event that we were to see, or the likelihood that we were to see sea levels rise. But the cost of these projects is just simply enormous. We're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars to you know, to do something and maybe you don't want green space, maybe you're just willing to kind of go with the Dutch model, uh, you know, <laughs> we'll just put up, you know, put up just big barriers or something um, to deal with that. But, you know, when you dig underneath Manhattan and you're digging below sea level, projects become more expensive, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a pretty significant challenge to deal with this and incredibly expensive. So. What I did was, you know, to take something, I run a, uh, I have kind of a lab where we have a bunch of interesting data, including the ability to plot um, all single family housing transactions that took place <coughs> in the United States pretty much at the beginning of time. We can plot mortgages and credit changes and all this stuff. But for this purpose, um, what I did was just wanted to kind of ask the question. We sort of had Hurricane Sandy hit, which certainly in the Northeast was, you know, we, you could either sort of point to Katrina, which, you know, really hit New Orleans, or Sandy as events where, you know, they were major events, very significant changes associated with flooding and climate change that you might have said would have had an effect on how people thought about the world and thought about property values. So we went back just to sort of say, well, maybe people thought Katrina was a one-off and New Orleans was built in a strange way, but you know, New York, New Jersey, probably less so. Uh, although maybe you know, there are probably parts of the country where they think you know, New York, New Jersey is completely strange. Um, <laughs> but the uh, what we did is we plotted. We looked at the coast and we plotted by zip code. And I'll say this is because 
I was preparing for this, not writing an academic paper, but it sort of intrigued me to the point of thinking, you know, we do have the geo coordinates of every property transaction. So we could, in fact, look at very precise definitions of flood zones to try and look at property changes. Um, exactly where the flood zone is. So think of this as a little bit of an appetizer to what one might get if you did a you know significant study. Of this. So what we did is we just plotted areas. We used the NOAA website and just sort of said in 2050 um, where are places that are at some risk of flooding. And if you wanted to look at very significant risks, and it turns out for these maps, it's sort of hard to have gradations of price changes and also gradations of flooding. Um, and still be able to read it. So we took a sort of simple measure of flooding. The closer you are to the coast, pretty much, it's not obviously linear. You know, some places have pretty quick rises after the coast, but the closer you get to the coast, obviously the worse the flooding is likely to get as sea levels rise. And we just plotted the changes. And to control for, you know, to control for at least some kind of economic conditions, what we did is we looked within each state and we looked at standard deviation changes in prices. So green mean the darker green reflects the largest increases in prices, and the red reflects the two standard deviation chain declines in prices. And we did this over a five-year period, so we started just prior to uh, Hurricane Sandy. And I'll show you different parts of the country. Um, I'm happy to send the slides around to anybody who's interested. Um, and it's a little hard, you know, given the size of the chart in the room, to go through these. I've been on a computer with, you know, greater resolution, et cetera, to look at this. And what we did is I just looked at different parts. This is the, you know, I could do a quiz if, you know, a state quiz to see if you know where all the states are. This is the Pacific Northwest. Um, the two green areas, and you'll see that this is almost a completely common factor, are all places which are located in metropolitan areas. So this is Portland. This is Seattle. And you can see as we go around, the first pattern which anybody who studies real estate or invests in real estate understands is that if you're a metropolitan area, particularly in inner cities, um, you're going to see house prices having risen a lot. These are places, you know, millennials are kind of coming back. Downtown areas are a lot more popular. So you'll certainly see darker green as you get closer to, um, to big cities. And so I wanted to focus in a little bit. This is Seattle. If you were going to kind of guess where flooding would be, it would be along here, not along here. So the places in downtown Seattle are the places where we're seeing the highest price changes taking place. Now, there are some, also some flood zones in places that are not in sort of located very close to the city. And those places, for the most part, are going to be a mixed bag, as I'll show you in a little bit. Some of them are going to do well, some of them are not. And some of the places where you say, gosh, I can't believe people are really, you know, still willing to buy housing there at good prices are actually slightly above average. This is Portland, the sort of flooding along the river, maybe, you know, maybe or maybe not sea level rising will affect that as much. Um, this is California. You can sort of see that where would you guess the highest price changes? Those are going to be in the Bay Area. Um, which is in sort of the northern part in Los Angeles and the southern parts so of this is the Bay Area. And again, you can see places that are likely to be impacted by sea level rises are, you know, in the darker green area. And it's not because people want to live in places that are prone to flooding. It's because those are very attractive communities based on their, you know, locations and, you know, commuting in Silicon Valley and, you know, all the tech stuff going on in uh, San Francisco, same as Seattle. So it's, you know, the pattern that I'm seeing in all of this is more of sort of benign neglect than uh, the pattern that sort of says, hey, we're really, you know, we think this is a serious issue. So you can look at other, you know, this is the Los Angeles area. Again, the economy not doing as well as San Francisco. If I plotted this relative to the rest of the country, the Los Angeles area would be doing well. But within California, because you have Northern California where prices have gone up a lot, then Southern California prices have gone up less relative to Northern California. Um, Florida, um, look along the coast. Again, tons and tons of green right along the coast, particularly the Gold Coast. Um, Jeff Heal actually had his students um, look at Mar-a-Lago in class and look at you know what would happen if you sort of believed the climate models and thought about what Mar-a-Lago you know what would happen in terms of uh, Mar-a-Lago's ability to. Uh, 
to do well, but it, you know, it turns out you can just go up and down the coast. And why is that? Well, there's a bunch of Latin American money that's looking for safety in the U.S. Um, they may or may not be safe. They may be safe from their local governments um, <laughs> here, but it may or may not be safe relative to uh, relative to rising waters. Um, other places, you know, the Maryland, Virginia, again, less of an issue. Why? Because D.C., although it's in a flooding zone, is probably much less likely. To, for the flooding to hit here relative to places closer to the coast. Um, go up in Massachusetts, you know, upper New England, or southern New England, where there, you know, where do you see dark green? You see it in southern Connecticut, sort of commuting into Fairfield County, and you see it in the Boston area. Probably the good news, although uh, Martha's Vineyard is slightly light green, um, Nantucket is slightly below, but the Cape, at least, you know, maybe you sort of say, you know, people who are buying, you know, play, buying property in vacation places, maybe they're paying a little more attention. Um, this is the Hamptons out here on the right, so certainly everybody's not paying attention um, <laughs> because Hampton prices are certainly rising, uh, are rising quite a bit. So it's not, uh, you know, it's not the, um, certainly not a consistent pattern of looking at climate change. And there are properties in the Hamptons that are actually needing to be renovated already as a result of rising waters. The final thing is, where did Hurricane Sandy really hit? It's places which are pretty dark green. Places that were flooded out where there were very significant issues. And these house prices started prior to Hurricane Sandy. So this is where things are today relative to where they were prior to Sandy. And even in places that flooded, had significant amounts of flooding, we haven't seen consistent changes in prices that reflect people saying, these are really places I'm worried about living. So this is, by the way, New Orleans. This is the 19th Ward. Um, you know, the same, the same kind of, the 19th Ward, the same kinds of problems that, you know, the, where are people looking at this? So as an economist and somebody who studies housing markets, I've always, I mean, there's a little bit of people don't believe stuff till it happens. You know, when did the Second Avenue when prices go up after the Second Avenue subway opened? Sometimes six months before it opened, even though there was construction and other stuff earlier. When people actually saw it, you know, were realized it's really going to open. You know, prices start to adjust. So maybe people don't perfectly anticipate what they'd like, but you know, I think this is something that is worth understanding because the. It's not going to be possible unless we devote an enormous amount of resources to protect the real estate in all of these places. And so how we understand that to happen and how we get people to think and real, you know, and consider climate change, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a psychologist and I'm not somebody who sort of, you know, in a sense, what I study is how markets try and incorporate information. But I think this is a question worthy of more interest, and that's why having done these plots, it's sort of gotten me intrigued to try and do more precise estimation to look at this. The last thing I'll sort of say, though, as somebody who studies the interaction of government and markets, is the government certainly isn't helping the problem in ways that you might think are sort of, you know, would be more obvious to do. And why is it that places post-Sandy and post-Katrina have been, you know, have seen so little effect on this? Well, if I cut quotes out from the last six months, FEMA is required to draw flood maps. And post-Sandy, one of the things that happened is a requirement that people have to purchase very expensive flood insurance if they're located in a flood zone. That was supposed to be an attempt to have the market work and have flood prices rise, sorry, have insurance prices rise to discourage construction and to discourage people from building in places that are flood prone. That was a great idea. What has happened? Well, every time a flood map is drawn, the local politicians will then run to Washington and say, hey, you're raising insurance prices on poor, disadvantaged people in my community. How could you make housing unaffordable? So what happens then is FEMA goes and redraws the flood maps to get rid of places that were flood prone. And that includes parts of New Orleans that flooded during Hurricane Katrina. And that includes parts of the, the New York area that flooded during Katrina, during Sandy. So if what's going to happen in a sense is we're going to actually push back market signals 
that might otherwise serve to discourage people or to affect their investment decisions. It's going to be hard for market prices to reflect that. So people really believe that the government is going to rebuild their homes when they get flooded and pay lots of money and that they're not going to have to insure. It certainly dampens the market signal that would otherwise take place that would discourage people from reflecting what's actually going on in the environment. So lots of stuff here. The view this is just kind of a taste of things that I, you know, that I kind of dug into. I was really, you know, happy to be asked to discuss the paper. I'm not sure I discussed the paper, but I talked about the business impl implications of this a little bit. So thanks. Okay, we have uh, we have time for just a couple of questions. If, uh, if people want to add up, please. If you can just speak up. Sure. I just wanted to make I just wanted to make a point about that last point. Um, I'm actually here from the mayor's office. Uh, You're welcome. We, <laughs> we filed the appeal of the FEMA flood map. And the reason we did that is because our consultants found flaws in the science. Um, so our interest is making sure, for insurance purposes, that we have the most accurate maps. For the building code, however, the city adopted the preliminary maps, which are more stringent, and we actually believe overstate the risk, um, back in 2013, immediately following Sandy. The deal that the city and FEMA worked out going forward for the redrawing of these maps is to actually create two maps. One that reflects accurate current risk for insurance purposes, and one that reflects current uh, future conditions, taking into account climate change. And this is something that we are working on um, currently, and as the maps are expected to come out over the next few years, that's what we'll be seeing. So, while it seems like a political move, um, it's, actual, it's actually a scientific accuracy um, move. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, Jay? Uh, Jay Ho from uh, Lights with Group. It's great to see this kind of combination of uh, science and investment here. I, I was actually teaching a course at SEPA earlier this year on resilience and adaptation to finance trying to get at this point. So my, my question is about um, how the science can actually make the jump into investment, right? So you look at housing price rises. I'm wondering if you look at the fall rates uh, on mortgages, since two thirds of the small businesses that closed for Burbank King Sandy never reopened, and also the implications to um, default rates on mortgages or some kind of correlative analysis that could be done. Because you know we have two major federal agencies, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, that stand behind 30-year mortgage pools and don't disclose anything about climate risk to those pools of mortgages. So someone's going to have a great long short trade in the hedge fund industry against that. But I'm wondering if the data is actually precise enough, and if you've seen correlations in actual economic performance, like you've seen in underperformance in certain parts of the renewable sector. Thanks. Um, it's a great question. The well, thank you. Um, the first thing is, I don't think anybody can do a long short trade on this because the locations are too precise and the pools are too big to trade on it. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's you know would be challenging to do that. Um, but I but you know that's that's kind of the the smaller point. The larger point on this is you know we can certainly do that with our data because we have data on every housing default and foreclosure and can look at this. I think it's been isolated, but certainly federal money and rules that come in that limit sort of, you know, foreclosing on places when there are, um, you know, when there are events like this mm -hmm. were really designed to mitigate the impact of the disaster. On one hand, that's very humane to not go and file a bunch of foreclosures, you know, two months after Sandy when people are out of their homes and, you know, have lost, you know, have lost everything. The flip side is it means market price signals don't work because market price signals re, you know, rely on there being pain when something happens so it causes people to have losses and thus be averse to trying to do that again. So that's my point about sort of the market operating is if we don't let the market operate fully, 
um, then there would be problems. And I'll say that I talked to a principal at a lender, um, a you know, national lender, and that company, certainly this issue of flood zone is a huge issue for people being able to afford insurance. And there are lots of people who are uninsured in both flood zones and non-flood zones who don't have mortgages. And those people also face significant issues. But you know, again, I think the issue is are we going to you know, always bail people out of these problems? In the short term, it's humane. In the long term, you know, if we don't let market signals work and investors lose money, then we're not going to see changes.